Welcome, Sim Captains, to episode four of the Flight Brothers FT podcast. The podcast is recorded on July 19, 2020. In this episode, Hold My Beer, We Love All Three Holes, Cloud Crafting, and Taking a Load. If you are a listener or subscriber, make sure to click like. Subscribe if you haven't, and ring the bell for all of our notifications. Are you interested in supporting the podcast or this YouTube channel? Contact us at flightbrosft at gmail.com. Follow us on social media. Go to facebook.com slash flightbrothersft, on Instagram, flightft2019, and on Twitter, at flightft2019. Please note our Twitter now matches our IG. That helps us as much as it does you guys, because quite frankly, we would always forget one or the other. Welcome to episode... (laughs) Welcome to episode four and the uh, product announcements. We're going to hit this first with Tim. I don't know about you, but do you have any friends that say, um, hold my beer and then usually something bad happens? Usually, uh, or they need bail money. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, watch this. Hold my beer recently releasing their SR 22 has announced their citation 10. You know, when I uh, first clicked on this article, and I suggest everybody go to check it out, it'll be down below in the uh, video description. I was looking at the panel textures, and at first I was kind of like, meh, not very impressed. I don't. And then I looked closer at the displays, and I noticed they said um, uh, they have CRT for cathode ray tubes, basically televisions functionally, for displays. And so looking at the uh, displays, you can actually see the curvature of it. And it's so old school looking that, um, I don't know, I was, I was really just taken with it. What do you think about that, Lee? Yeah, uh, you pointed it out to me actually um, after we started recording this, and I hadn't noticed it as well. So there you go. I, something I have not seen as well. Um, also, they're going to include a full-featured FMS and... There are a few screenshots uh, listed for you guys to go check out. And they mentioned that they were going to have, you could have either the CFT or the TFT, the thin film transistor uh, displays. So C- CRT, not CFT. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. CRT and TFT. They were going to have multiple display styles. And I wasn't sure, look at the pictures, if we saw the TFT yet. But honestly, because I... Don't, I'm not actually familiar with what that is, but uh, yeah, that's but, kind of that um, HD displays you see in a lot of vehicles. You know, it's like that high definition, usually color and multifunction does different things. Oh, okay. So the CRT would be representing an older generation of Citation. Correct. TFT would be a modern, right, or an avionics suite. Yeah. So uh, feel free to throw this in the comments, but uh, if any of our listeners know, I can't think of a single X-plane aircraft that does a CRT display. So if you go look at it, I mean, you, you'll seriously see the uh, screen is curved and the uh, imagery on the screen curves with it. I mean, it, it takes me right back to 1980s nostalgia. I was really, like, blown away with that. So if, uh, if you guys know of any that are out there, let me know. Yeah, certainly. And, um, well, you know what? We should probably, well, that is a Citation 10. So that was for a brief time the world's largest, or sorry, the world's fastest private aircraft, right? Because it was like 0.92 Mach. And then the, what was it, the G6 or 650 beat it with a 0.925. Like a G6. Yeah, fly like a G6 for sure. All right, well, hey, enough on the Hold My Beer. We're watching it, and hopefully you guys will too. For more information, those screenshots, click below. Tim, I don't know about you, but, uh, man, I love three holes. And Quality Flight Simulations is giving us the three holes that we need in the L-1011-500. Now, they made this announcement May 6th, and we kind of missed it. But uh, it popped up on the forums and some of our lists. So now's the time to take a look at that. I just want everybody to be impressed. I didn't laugh this time. Earlier, we cut the video and came back in because I laughed when Lee read the uh, initial 
order for the day. So yeah, uh, <laughs> L ten eleven, fantastic. If uh, I don't know what age our listeners are on these podcasts, but if you are younger than Lee and I, you probably miss the era of trijets entirely, and you only see maybe MD elevens and some random DC tens hanging out in cargo ramps. Sure. But uh, the L-1011 had a very serious presence in the 80s and 90s when uh, Lee and I were growing up, and I'm just bummed. I never got to fly in one. You ever on an L-1011? No, no. Only uh, MD-11 for me, as far as trijets. So, I have heard from at least a few pilots who had flown multiple aircraft in their career. These would have been pilots who... uh, retired around 2000 or shortly into the 2000s and um quite a few say hands down l1011 was their favorite to fly Hmm. Uh, interesting mix of it had some very modern super high-tech things but it was still a very pilot's kind of plane and uh was that the first auto land that sounds familiar I believe you're correct. I think it had the first auto land capability. Well, that should have some fans here in the X plane community to be sure. <laughs> yeah, that is that is a fact, sir. It'll be this screenshots is where galore. It all began, gentlemen, posting silly videos saying butter where you didn't actually touch the controls right here <laughs> with the L ten eleven. That's that's very true. But hey, take a look because they have the. Uh, there's no texture work. It didn't seem like, but it's they got a lot of the 3D modeling, including the flight engineers, and it looks like they're doing a really good job with it. That that was my feeling too. It was like, oh, because you always have to wonder, like, okay, how much are they going to bite off? Are they just going to do a fuselage in a cockpit? And um, I didn't see a cabin, but I thought I saw like some galley renderings. Mm-hmm. Maybe I just didn't know what I was looking at, but. Um, yeah, what they've got looks spot on. So hopefully they will find a really good texture artist to uh, cover it up. Sure, sure. And to be honest, uh, I'm a bit ashamed to say this, but I'm unfamiliar with quality flight simulations. Like, I'm not aware of them as a developer. So, um, Yeah, I'm going to own it. I've never heard of them. Right. So if any of you guys are aware of them or know of any aircraft they've done, please uh, comment below so maybe we can all go check it out. Um I'm going to take a guess here. That group is comprised of engineers. Their name is not nearly as entertaining as Hold My Beer. Quality Flight Sim. Sorry, engineers. I love you people, but it's the kind of name an engineer would come up with. Well, that's true. And you know the Hold My Beer guys, they're uh, German-based, I believe. So they're all uh, Deutschers. <laughs> that makes it so much better, doesn't it? I right. hope their uh, their graphic looks like. I'm imagining like a Starbucks logo that looks more like. Um, oh, what's the giant German beer festival? Oktoberfest. Oktoberfest. Why was that not coming? I don't know, but it's actually in September, I believe. We're gonna email them. I'm gonna recommend that a Starbucks asked Oktoberfest. Logo with an airplane worked in. Right, right. I think it's actually a beer mug. They might have a beer mug. Well, all right. We're going to move on. I have a very graphic mental image of what this is going to look like. Uh, I don't mean that to be some graphic. I mean just a very vivid mental image. Right, right. Well, draw it's it down. Very PG. <laughs> all right. Well, that. That wraps up product announcements uh, for this episode. And now on to product releases. And we actually missed this one during Podcast 3 as well. The Nimbus Simulation Islander, the Britain Norman. Uh, It came out, I think, uh, just a few days before Podcast 3 did. They have 3D modeling, 4K textures, and PBR and custom sound. So if you're looking to smash around the Caribbean, I guess, or... uh, well, Tim, this is kind of up your aisle because that's a British aircraft, is it not? Um, I guess it is, but honestly, I don't have much interest in the Islander. It's um, I don't like it. I just was never very excited by it. So when I clicked on the link and looked at it, I'm like, yeah, it looks like they did a great job. They had a bunch of 
the great liveries, but um, I just personally am not excited by it. And I, I think most flight simmers that way. We all have our, our thing that like to the planes we love, and these to the planes we're ambivalent to. And right, like, right. all right, looks like a good islander. Sure. Else? Well, and, and it seems in my mind, it's an island hopper, just like um, what was the one that was just released a month or two ago? I was actually just thinking that like we had been talking about an islander, right? Was that a different uh, developer? It, it was a different de developer. Yes. But uh, two people drop an islander like within the same two or three months. That's it. I think it was tighter than that, actually. I think it was a matter of weeks, because I seem to remember we did a podcast talking about the other one, then this one came out. So, anyway. Um, All right. I guess you Islanders got your... everywhere. If, if you guys want them, they're out there. They're, they're out choices. there. That's it. Competition. It's good for you. So, the next one, I think, uh, looks pretty neat. Aero Basque has a Lancer Legacy RG coming out. A uh, two-seat low-wing kit experimental aircraft with retractable landing gear. It says it comes alive with a powerful Continental IO550, 310 horsepower engine, making it capable of achieving a cruise speed of 276 miles per hour with a range of about 1,000 nautical miles. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, Lee, is this not supposed to be one of the fastest non-turbos out there? Yeah, I believe that's right. It was the because originally it was a kit, and I think it they kind of spawned off their own category at the Reno Air Races. So I think they were kind of a general category at first. Then they were so fast, they just kind of made their own almost homologated series of them because they were so quick and they were uh, just kind of beating the pants off of everyone. Fantastic. Now, um, I was just thinking myself when I looked at it. An X plane. There's a default aircraft called the Columbia 400, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a little dated. It's kind of neat, but the panels kind of a mess for X plane 11. Honestly, it needs to be touched up. But I was looking at the uh, cockpit of this Lancer Legacy, and I was like, mm, these look very related. So I think Lee, were you telling me the Columbia was? originally a Lancer and then it went to Cessna or what was the what happened there yeah if I recall correctly the the Lancer was originally a, a kit or Lancare I, I can't remember it's uh something Lance I think was the guy's last name that came up with it but uh Columbia was the certificated version it was the turnkey version that you could buy of a oh. Lancer Okay. And that came in a 300 model, which was a 300 horsepower, which we see in this version. And then later, I can't remember the process leading up to it. I think Columbia needed a little cash or something. Then Cessna came along, purchased it, and they produced a turbocharged version called the Cessna 400. That subsequently changed names to the Cessna TTX which they built up until uh, early 2018. And there just wasn't enough uh, market. I think Cirrus really moved in there and took that market out from under him. Right. Well, I'll tell you what, th that might be an aircraft we need to get in our uh, review schedule as it would be interesting to see how, what similarities there are between the default Laminar Columbia and this Lancer Legacy. Uh, but I would be willing to bet already that if you go fly the uh, default Columbia mm -hmm. and like it and enjoy it at all, you're probably going to really like this Legacy because it's anywhere quality and will actually have a panel that looks good and is high def. And you... <laughs> Well, and I have the Aero Basque DA-62, and I love that airplane. Like, the... Just the overall appearance, the feel, the sound, like, you know, I mean, we have a video on the on the channel here that you guys Check can it take, out. Right, if you can take a look at. Um, but it was wonderful, and, like, I, I want to get this just to sample another Aero Basque aircraft because I think it would be that good. However, for me, the I have really no 
desire, if I could say that, for, for Lantair. So um, I, I'm sure the quality is on par. I mean, they had the uh, f- fake oxygen sounds in the DA62. So you could pull the oxygen knob and you hear breathing. So I'd imagine this is really good. You know, uh, Robasque's um, A62, you, your video actually made me, uh, if you guys don't know how we do this, Lee and I live, I don't know, 20, 30 miles from each other. And so we just email each other stuff and check things over the cloud. And so I was watching his video just for editing purposes. And I was like, I want this plane. I had no interest in it before. I honestly wasn't familiar with it at all. But uh, it was obvious to me just from Lee's video that like, oh, this thing's great. Now, I haven't gone out and bought it. But that's only because we're so swamped in aircraft that we're reviewing and whatnot that uh, I just wouldn't get around to flying it. Shame. Right, yeah. T- time to fly just for the sake of doing it anymore is uh, getting few and far between. Now, now that said, i got to switch gears because there are those things we do for flight pros because we think they're interesting or we think that you will think they're interesting and so we want to do it for you and it's the stuff we do over at fselite.net but here comes one that i am gonna do for myself and for about three days now i've been wrestling (laughs) do i want to buy this or do i want to do it as a project so i don't have to pay for it and 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 i think i'm just probably going to open a new window and buy it right now because i want to support this developer um the name only X sim has released a Lockheed Lodestar. Now, if you're a modern person only flying Zebos, you probably have no idea what the Lodestar is and might only be vaguely aware of Lockheed. But the Lodestar is a uh, classic airliner and, and not in the sense of you're flying 200 plus passengers around, sure, or like a dozen, but uh, that's how the early days started. It's basically an oversized Lockheed Electra. Uh, Amelia Earhart type things with it too, if you wanted to try. But uh, I was checking it out. Lee, have you gotten a chance to look at the uh, the pictures? Yeah, I looked at them earlier. I got them up right now. Um, this is about the same size, is it not, of the DC-3? So would this have kind smaller. of... Smaller. This is smaller? Mm-hmm. Okay, okay like like decently smaller not okay. just like a little bit um i'm gonna say maybe two-thirds size like that yeah it looks like about a 10 passenger in the passenger configuration and again guys these links are below so to see what we're talking about um, well hold on i got a tip for everybody we're gonna have two links there one to the x-plane store where you buy it the developer has given the X-Plane store some terrible shots. Go to the X-Plane forums and look at the images he posted there. It gives you a way better overview. The ones they, they sent into the X-Plane store, it's like three of the same shots of the panel, one exterior. It just does not do justice to what they've done here. So I, I want you to see good views. Go to the X-Plane forum. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, and Tim, you might want to throw that link in here because this is for their other product, which is that JU-52. Oh, right. Okay, so we'll, we'll get that down there too. Yeah. But one sure. of the things I was wondering when this came out was um, it's only X Sim. <laughs> I was like, who yeah. is that? So it turns out this is the person who put out the Junkers uh, JU-52, or which is uh, the old German. Kind of looks like a... You took a Ford tri-motor and a DC-3 and smashed them together, mm-hmm. which you would have. And uh, that seems to be well done. And this is an interesting category of developer in my mind because, you know, we have our big studio developers like Carinato, and then we have our slightly smaller ones that still put out really good products. Like FlyJ Sim, I don't think is really that big. Mm-hmm. And they do good work. Uh, but, you know, they, they have, a what, four products? Or Carinado has, like, 30. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went to Carinado's website earlier today, and I think they had new on, like, eight aircraft in the X-Plane section. <laughs> I was like, uh, here whoa. I, 
you're like, I'm on page three of 12. Yeah, yeah. And they have an inventory. It is no joke. So uh, here's somebody who has released two aircraft. And great thing with these oddball developers is they're typically a labor of love. Here's somebody who has the technical computer know-how to do it and the aviation know-how to, to do it. And um, they're doing it because they really want these planes out there. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm not faulting these d- big developers, but they're not going to sink the time and to give you a load star because there probably just isn't that much profit potential there. Sure. Uh, I've wanted a load star for about a year now, and there weren't even – there might have been one really, really blah old one that like had been ported in from X-Plane 7 or something and hard pass. <laughs> Bad. So – I was very excited this came out um, that I'm going to be doing something with it on the channel. So go check it out. All right. I talked too much about that. Lee, you want to take the next one? Sure. This one's kind of in my wheelhouse. By the time, hopefully, that you guys are listening to this, Torque Sim will have released their SR-22, which is supposed to be released this week. Tim, as you're well aware, um, I've been pretty, pretty pumped about this one. been looking for this one for a long time. We've been hearing about it for a while. Right, yeah. I think we've mentioned a few of its development updates over maybe even the length of all these podcasts at this point. So, yeah, they're claiming it'll be one of the most sophisticated and study-level sim aircraft for X-Plane. And I don't doubt that, man. There was one article I was reading months ago, and it was one of their early updates uh, shortly after I discovered the product, which was probably about beginning of this year where they were talking about how to map the airflow through the turbocharger to the individual cylinders and then how to replicate that through the electronic engine control system and display and I mean you know me that was like at the top of my nerd meter like that that level of time and engineering and develop like that does it for me so I'm looking really forward to getting this aircraft and there will probably be one of uh, an SR-22 video to follow sometime after that from me. You know, th- this is perfect because this is case in point. Uh, Lee and I were recording like two Mad Hatters last weekend, uh, a video for FS Elite and one for Flight Brothers that just dropped uh, this morning. And one of the conversations that came up was about this study level thing and you know how much how much realism do people really want and and actually again here's one for the comments throw it in the comments do you like the aircraft to be so realistic it's completely unforgiving it's as snickety as the real plane or do you like it to be a little more just turnkey hey i'm here to chill after work i just want to fly planes i don't want to be hassled with nitty gritty uh we'd like to know what you think I'm personally like Lee's geeking out about this SR-22, and I'm thinking that sounds like a massive pain in the tush. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't want to poke you, Tim, but we've got another thing to follow up on that a little bit further down in our uh, m- more along our banter section. So let's All revisit right. that if we can, sir. We'll be back then. All right. Yeah, we'll come back on that. Do you want to handle news, or uh, do you want me? All to- right, I'll do the next one because. Uh, August 18th of this year, which is usually a pretty special day for me. Right. Uh, it's going to be ruined by the release of Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. <laughs> dun, dun, uh, no. If this is the first you're hearing of this release date, I'm going to be amazed. You so would I'm have lived under multiple that. rocks. Right. Like, if you're such an av geek that you listen to the Flight Brothers podcast but didn't know that, it would literally blow my mind, and you should definitely put that in the comments. But um, the, the great thing now that there's a solid release date is mm-hmm. now we can start to see how the rubber will meet the road. So they're going to have a standard and a premium and a deluxe edition, right? It's three tiers? Yeah, it's three tiers. And then I guess the you gain one or two aircraft or three aircraft with you know, going up the tiers and then you gain some, I think they call them like handcrafted airports. So let's, in my mind, that's saying, okay, we're going to put 
uh, you spend the 20 bucks or 30 bucks extra to get the premium, you're going to get five Orbex style airports. Whereas if you spend the $120 or whatever for the premium deluxe, you're going to get 15 Orbex style airports. Right. And, and that's because when I first read the pricing scheme, I actually thought, ah, this is kind of lame. And then I found out they actually are including all of the world airports. Just if you want, you know, custom, what we would think of as payware grade airports in X Plane 11, then you need to, uh, you would probably want to do this. So I started thinking to myself, you know, if you bought X Plane at base price, and they offered you for 30 bucks more that you would get another five Orbix airports and uh, three payware airliners, another 50 bucks, you would get, they're thinking, you know, in the X plane economy, that's actually a steal of a price. I mean, generally speaking, what are we, what are we paying for a payware aircraft? 20, 25 on the cheap up to 75 to a hundred for the, uh, yeah. You know, airliners? Yeah, I I would say it's very broad. I'd definitely say that twenty to a hundred hundred dollars is a safe spot to be. I mean you're gonna hit everything in there. Uh, I mean I wasn't saying that to just be wildly ridiculous, but on one hand, uh, like some of the flight factor packages rocking about a hundred bucks right now. Sure. And then you've got these more modest offerings like the uh oh I think this uh Lodestar is telling me about it's like twenty four dollars. So whatever quite the quite the spread so really the microsoft pricing i actually think it sounds pretty reasonable well it beats the original rumor right which was a subscription based thing so whether that was in their cards or not this is good for us consumers that they're not going with that model because you know good luck getting what is it microsoft office anymore for a, a flat fee yeah well you know just one of the interesting things with flight sim, not to, I don't want to get on this for like six hours, but now that uh, Lee and I run this channel and we have a lot of people who comment and ask questions and this and that, mm -hmm. uh, we're only dealing with our, our fellow Americans about 50% of the time. Right. A ton of Brits, uh, a lot of Aussies. Um, Occasionally some Italians, Germans. Yep. Germans. Um, sometimes people from other places that speak even less English who are communicating in, in chat bars where we're both using Google Translate to right. try to <laughs> figure it out. So, you know, particularly where the, um, where the exchange rate of the U.S. dollar is different, you know, $75 payware aircraft in the U.S., relative to U.S. economics it is worth one thing. Sure. But, uh, for example, my wife is from the Philippines, and we have a bunch of Filipinos in the flight sim. $75 in the Philippines in their economics is a lot more. So Microsoft offering this as a subscription, I was, I was always a little afraid that might price out any of our global flight simmers for whom, you know, if I know up front I need to, with 75 100 us dollars i can do that. But if right. i need 30 us dollars a month get about it sure sure all right that's all i had to say on that well that's okay while you were talking about that i was actually trying to find the link for that news release over uh that news release over on fs elite i can't find it right now so hopefully guys by the time this goes live we'll have that link for you um if not right. um if not, just go to fselite.net because they will definitely keep you posted on the uh, latest news. Yep, that's true. And a lot of our links are from there and uh, good stuff. So, <laughs> VC10, Tim. Um, dun, dun, dun. Take it, man, because this is your wheelhouse yet again. All right. Now, uh, two interesting things. First, VC10. Second, just flight. So, the VC10 is... We want to think of it as the British competitor to the 707. Go ahead and think of it that way. Um, it was custom built to the requirements of the OAC in British Airways. And ironically, <laughs> the OAC, this is no joke, 
realized they got better, you know, cost per seat mile there out of the 707. And they only bought like a handful of them. And most of them ended up terminating their service life in the uh, British military. They're an excellent aircraft. Everyone who flew it loved it. Passengers loved it. It was from an engineering standpoint, fantastic. It's just from an economic standpoint, 707 killed it. Now, uh, Regarding Just Flight, Lee and I got a chance to review their Vulcan bomber. Yep. And yep. man, home run knocked it out of the park. If you wanted to just jump in and go, they gave you that option. If you wanted to get in and do systems depth and be a geek like Lee, mm-hmm. you had that option. And and it, it felt like the immersion level was as good as anything I have in X Plane. Like it really you could convince yourself you were chilling in there. So, um, which that I, video, that video is over on FS elites, uh, YouTube. So go over there and give that a watch. If you want to see that. Oh, right, right. Yeah. If you find the Vulcan on our channel, that's a freeware. It's also pretty cool, especially for free. Sure. Just, it's not the just flight, which is, uh, eight years quantum leap ahead. Mm-hmm. Uh, the VC 10. So I clicked on the development shots. Did you get a chance to see them? Lee? I did look at those, and I'm trying to get back there now. Yeah, it's um, you can actually sign up to it just flights website, and they will email you when it's available. Well, see, here's the funny thing: I kept looking at those development shots and mm-hmm. thinking about how good that Vulcan was, and I thought this cockpit is not that good. Well, um, I just heard about the VC10 what uh within two months so i don't know how far along they are in the development of it so i wouldn't i wouldn't cast it off yet it's just the texturing i i thought the texturing looks a little yeah i don't know why it just it wasn't as convincing to me as um some other things and i don't know if that's a function of lighting or whatnot but i mean with their vulcan they just home run perfect and so i looked at this and i thought Oh, I should be more excited right now, and I, I just wasn't. Sure, and I'm on Just Flight's website, and it looks like a lot of their images they have are kind of that that low slanted light with the shadows, and it's the kind of stuff you would do. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know that it um, sets the product off too well. But I, I I think it would be I think the product in the end is probably going to be a home run for those who are fans of the VC10. Right now, now. I'm ragging on the textures there, guys. Um, and maybe they're going to improve and maybe they'll look better in usage. But um, I would say our experience with Just Flight so far shows they know how to make a plane mm-hmm. to do it right. So I would not be surprised in the slightest if this thing was magnificent and nearly perfect um, from a systems and operation standpoint. Yeah, I would. Uh, I would agree with that. Well, should we uh, kick the can down on the news section? Keep rolling here. Do it, because I'm actually buying a Lodestar in the other uh, screen. Perfect. All right. Well, I'll take this. Uh, Carinado recently had their 40% off sale. So if you missed that, um, it was all over. I think a lot of the big online retailers, uh, Sim Market, Xplane.org, uh, Just Flight, uh, they all had the Carinado uh, products discounted. Tim and I took advantage of that. We'll talk about that a little later here. My wallet still hurts. Well, that's true, yeah. And as we record this, uh, Orbex has a free weekend on July 18th and 19th, where if you yeah, are so, in... So it's going to be over by the time this releases. Sorry, gentlemen, I hope you got it somewhere else. <laughs> and ladies, yeah, Brisbane is available for FSX P3D as a free download and Corsival for X-Plane 11. This is part of their, I think, are promoting their Fly July event. They have True Earth, Northern California, South, uh, Central, and Northern Great Britain, and numerous airports on sale. So if you're interested in that, slide over to OrbexDirect.com. This is, uh, we have no sponsorships or anything with them, guys. We're just really trying to bring you news on what's going on. So by the time this goes live, you still have a few days left, hopefully, to uh, cash in on the Fly July event. Updates, Tim. Um, 
You want to take the A350, or do you want me to run with that one for the time being? I also added one down below here, so... You know, um, that is the only one I didn't look at, so you can take it away on the A350. Well, for purchasers of the Flight Factor A350, they have completed the update to 1.6.8. That change log added a lot of features. The biggest one, I think, that they were calling for is added the SID and STAR support, so... If you are an owner of that or that was something hanging you up, uh, it's done. They've added new cockpit textures, uh, some particles. They've worked fuel consumption, numerous other fixes. Again, click that link below if you want the detailed change log. Uh, the downside to this 1.6.8 is... The price increase, uh, it was on sale for a little while, uh, they were talking about it, so it has gone up, I believe, I don't have it immediately handy, but I think it's about $64.99 US dollars now, I think it was closer to 50 so um, you missed your chance on that one, but hey, it's supposed to be a more capable aircraft, so if you're looking for an A350, Flight Factor's got you covered. Some friends of ours over at XCraft did a big update uh, for the... ERJ. Ace. Tim, uh, of course, Steve got a hold of us. Uh, I think it was, what, the day before that. So they have made numerous, numerous, numerous updates to the uh, FMS, some lighting, some sound, guys. If you have uh, if you have this aircraft in your hangar, I believe they were wanting a download. Is that right? Go re-download it as opposed to running the Skunk Craft Updater. Yeah, that was uh, that was the suggestion. Was it said the safest option is to download it from the X Plane Store? You go into the, your my account, assuming you're using X Plane. Sure, yeah. And uh, you can try Skunk Craft, but it sounds like they might be aware that that is hit and miss for some people. They didn't say don't do it. They just said it's safer to re-download the. Right, right. So. Um... For those of you who have the ERJ, which we love, that was another one of those aircraft that, um, that was an early one for us. And when we got a hold of that, it really kind of changed the game with, there was that balance, um, and we'll discuss this a little bit more below, guys, but that complexity of, you know, what type of aircraft do you want? So maybe we'll rain check that, Tim. Um, I think that kind of uh, summarizes where we're at here as far as updates for this month, episode uh, podcast four. So on to what we've been up to. Well, I released yeah. the Helleborn video review on uh, July 8th. And you released the FlyJ Sim 727, 737 comparison on uh, June 24th. So uh, what do we got there? FlyJ did really good. Yeah, uh, that I think that's been pretty well received. Uh, really, what I wanted people to have was the opportunity to just see side by side what the two products are offering. I mean, they're they're both FlyJ quality. It's just that uh, you know the seven twenty seven has some capabilities as an aircraft. The seven thirty seven does not. Mm -hmm. But the uh, FlyJ has put a lot of the little little cutesy things into their 737 that um you know you don't need them but man they make it fun like back in the cabin first off it has a cabin um sure uh overhead bins open every mm -hmm. single one of them completely useless right but it was so cool i mean i can't tell you how did i text you immediately when i found that i feel like i did <laughs> i think you i think you did and i think you actually uploaded a video or something like that I had to text Lee because I know literally no one else no one cares <laughs> interact with cares at all. That's part of why we run Flight Brothers. It's so we can find our people. Every voice listening to this, God bless you all. Right. Who are definitely our sort of geek. Well, uh, and, and the question that comes up a lot with those, Tim, is the is the price point because Fly J Sim is not a cheap product. However, in my opinion, you get what you're paying for with it. There's, it's a known quantity, and a lot of people they, they probably want both aircraft, but because of that cost, they're like, ah, which one should I get? And that's a, 
that's a gray area. You don't really want to answer that question because I think both of these are winners. But doubling the price to buy both of them because you want them, I think, might be a bit much for some people, you know, regardless of their disposable income, you know, if that's a, an issue. Right. Uh, I would just say, you know, people with tattoos, they never have one, right? Right, yeah. As usually the, the, it's one of those things people get hooked. I, I find the same thing uh, with a, a variety of hobbies out there. I, I think with the fly jays, what you'll find is if you buy one, go ahead, watch my video, pick the one that you think you will like better. After you have flown it for a while, you're going to like it so much. You are eventually going to save your pennies or if you already have them saved, just go buy the other one because you're going to be like, you know what? And you will. Yep. I, I agree. I do not have the 737, but I will. And, um, yeah. You know, on the opposite end, and FlyJ, actually, I think they reshared that one, or they gave you some love out there on um, Instagram or something. But that All video right. did that video did pretty good. Um, mine, not so much. The Helleborn, and I think it just might be a little bit of the... The crowd or something? I'm not. I'm well, not you know, sure. no, I don't think anybody Google's it because nobody knows what it is. I didn't know what it was until they told me, "Hey, get this game. It's uh, on sale for seven bucks on Steam." Right, and totally random. Um, well, and we also didn't have an audience to put it in front of. So, um, for those of you who don't know, we're pretty active in some of the Facebook groups, uh, X Plane, X Plane Addicts. But because this was not X Plane related, we didn't want to promote it there. So. For those of you who are subscribers, you you got the ding, and um, hopefully you'll take a look at Helleborn, check it out, take a look at that video, and see if it's something you're interested in. Because yeah. I'm a Sam, uh, definitely a game, but I, I yeah, we enjoy it totally. So I guess uh, as soon as we wrap up this video, we're probably going straight into Helleborn. I'm going to tell you all right now that is where we will be the moment at this. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. I I would like to fly the uh, DAP, man, the um, AH-60L. I want some Hellfire rockets to blow some stuff up. But, uh, nice. nice. So, um, <laughs> in addition to production, uh, we've got the FS Elite video on the Carinado PA-46 recently released. That may be live on FS Elite's YouTube channel, so go check that out over there by the time you get a hold of this. Right, it's supposed um, to release on uh, 720, so that would be tomorrow from our recording, but about a week in the past by the time we release this podcast. Right, for sure. So um, that was a good aircraft. We've uh, talked a little bit about that. Um, do we want to address... I'll let you take those if you want to, yeah, Tim. Yeah, I'll but these real quick. Yeah, and um, it rolls into the bottom there below that. Uh, this morning, July 19th, 2020, we released a video... Uh, a preview actually of SSG 747.8 version 2.2 update. Uh, we were flying the beta. We had beta, what, two, three, four, and they've got a beta five maybe about to come out. Sounds like in the email. Uh, five so, already came out. I flew it. Oh, wow. So, um, I mean, they are, they are hard at work fine tuning the details on this. Uh, go check out the video because I don't want to spend a lot of time telling you everything I already put into a video and you'll love the visuals. Sure. It is a feast for the eyes because they've added greater and that's really most of what the video is about. Um, another cool thing, I recorded it a week ago. We just kicked it back in the schedule, but in August we're going to release a video on the Pan Am board game. And if you're thinking that's not Flight Sim, well, it kind of is. It's just a board game. Uh, airline sim and it's a uh, it's a really beautiful game my oldest son is annoyed because i haven't let him play with it yet <laughs> it has airliners in it and stock and maps and travel posters the uh game cards some of the gameplay are classic pan am travel posters and i'll be honest even if you never played the game if you just bought it and if you're an av geek or a pan am geek or you're me, and so you're the both. You can just open the box and play with everything. We'll be very happy. So uh, that's available at Target. Well, that video will be coming out. Yeah, and Tim, my uh, my daughter watched that 
after you had posted it and uh you know she's oh, yeah. what you think yeah she's at that age where unboxing videos are kind of a thing but she really enjoyed it she said you did a good job and she kind of wanted to play it that was her uh her exact words Peace. so hopefully you guys oh. will too this covid crap ever lets up uh maybe we'll actually get together uh lee lee's children and, and mine are they made just Unfortunately, due to COVID, they haven't seen other children now in months. So True, yeah. One of these days, we'll get to play a game. So, uh, all right. So, we're closing in, but we've got a few more things here. Lee, what's next? Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about beta testing. And this, we can kind of roll this in a little bit with what we were talking about further down. So, this comes up a lot, guys, in the uh, guys and girls in the emails and the, the communications we see between consumers like us and the developers. Um, you know, with the 748, when when we have an issue, the devs always want the data, whether it's video, whether it's screenshots, or whether it's a log file, so that they can reproduce it and and actually work on the bug and my day job tim's well aware uh, is, is in maintenance and one of the most difficult things is when we go to our end user and they say there's this problem and then we check on it and we can't replicate it so you know with this beta you know we we had issues you guys can see that in the in the video uh, of tim's 747.8 and you just send the log file or a point of context says, yeah, we fixed it. Yeah, we didn't. Uh, we're working on it. Hey, thanks. And and off you go. And I saw recently in the .org forum, somebody in there complaining to a large developer and someone who takes a, produces really high quality products. And somebody was in there just ranting and raving. And they said, uh, hey, guys, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but complaining doesn't get anything done but give us raw data so we can work on it and that kind of strikes a chord with i think tim and i because we've been doing the beta thing and work less um what's the word we we try and keep it just more clinical right tim when we see a problem we understand well it might not be just us right yeah i think clinical that's the perfect word for it and and some of that could be a maybe we're just patient people. Uh, I'm a school teacher by day, so I think it automatically brands me as one of the most patient people on the planet. But um, I, I think most of our patients with it, as we realize, especially these high end simulations, are trying to replicate an extremely complicated thing in a three dimensional environment. On a computerized system, oh, and by the way, they don't know what computer you have. Get on any forum, you know, people have these ridiculous questions. Mm -hmm. Let's play X plane. Will this uh, an X plane well? Is this the best? And so um, you realize there's so many variables here. It's not, it's not like walking into the store and buying some mundane product with three moving pieces that really should work 100% of the time in every way possibly used. You're buying a simulated aircraft with thousands of possible ways you interact with it. Mm -hmm. And if the developer and the beta testers didn't do every ridiculous thing that you do with it, you might actually have accidentally found something new that they never ran into. So uh, X-Plane does turn out a log file at the end of every X-Plane session and and that is really how they can uh, get under the hood and figure out what went wrong if you ran into a problem. Yeah, and it's in the what is it? it's in the X plane folder, right? And it just sits just inside that folder. It's like log.txt. Hey, well, I'm gonna look that up and confirm. Yes, the X plane folder. It is log.txt. Yep. So every time you end a session, if it crashes or it does this or it does that, go make a copy of that and then send it into your your dev. The good ones, ones we've dealt with, they'll say, uh, and what we've seen, you know, they'll say, well, that's a 
problem, we'll work on it, or we already know about that, we're working on it, or that's an X plane one, send it to them. So just, you know, mm. be, be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And just, uh, you, you, we're all one big community guys. I mean, n- not that we don't sympathize. Cause I get it. If you, sure. you get in there and you're like, I spent all this money on the SIM and my yoke and I spent 75 bucks on an aircraft or a hundred or 25 and you're, I get it. You're raw. You're cranky on it to work. It doesn't. It's just, you know, step back for a moment a niche community flight sim is not that big and uh oh oh well, you are actually sometimes the, the beta tester all right <laughs> <laughs> right right and well and, and speaking of uh beta testing leading to the, the development of products um we were talking earlier about how real do we want the simulation experience uh you and i in making fs elites video we're talking about this, uh, quote, Carinado formula that we were uh, talking about. And I saw another forum communique and someone asked if they had to do a pre-flight. Now, the person bought a add-on that allowed them to do a pre-flight, but then (laughs) asked if they didn't do the pre-flight, would there be a consequence of not doing the pre-flight? To which... Can we read this as a quote exactly okay. as it was? Go ahead. Go ahead. Personally, guys, I got a lot. Like the second I saw it, I was I was laughing. So here's how it goes. Uh, the person who uh, it doesn't say their name, so I don't know who wrote this. Anything bad happen if the flight is not completed? Question mark. I can't remember if it is this aircraft that does random things if it isn't pre-flighted. Dot dot dot. I just, you know, ace palmed right there. <laughs> yeah, and now we don't, we're not forming an opinion of that person based on this because we realize there are simmers of all experience levels, of all ages. Like, we don't know anything about this. However, the the dev responded, it may, but it's not based on what you do during the pre-flight. Simply, some things may be broken and you don't know if it's because you didn't check them in pre-flight. And let's just do a really simple example of this, guys. I put five gallons of fuel in my airplane and I take off for um, a 400-mile trip. Well, clearly I didn't figure that one out right. So when it runs out of fuel, that's on me. Um, and... Tim and I both have these reality expansion packs. You have oil, you have tires, you have electronic devices that wear. The pre-flight is for checking all this, both in the real world and the sim, if you have these these add-ons. And um, yeah, so it just kind of struck us as one of those things that how real do we want this? Uh, Tim, I'll let you talk about the SSG hydraulics. All right, let me take back a little bit of my giggling. What this person said in flight sim is not actually that ridiculous. But in the real world is horrifying. Yes. And so it really depends on because Lee and I, most of the time, Lee's better about it than me, try and approach flight sim as though it was real world. It's not. We know it's not. But we try and treat it with that level of respect. Um. But if you just treat it like it's a game, it's a sim, I darn well know I left failures off, then yeah, you you really can, with complete confidence, not pre-flight, know that you know your vacuum system is functioning sim. But the real world, terrible. Mm-hmm. Terrible. All right, you were asking me about SSG and how yeah. real do we want? Yeah, just how real do we want these? Okay, so here's here's my, my my thought because we know there's varying opinions between developers and the flyers, and I don't think there is any consensus. Like, what's sure. the best toppings on a pizza? It just depends on your opinion. It's not pineapple. If you were, see, and I love pineapple. Right. If you were to, um, if you asked me, Tim, I only have one plane for the next year, that's all you can sim then I would want the most bag nab study level every nitty gritty detail because that's what's going to keep me entertained. 
But if you're jumping in different aircraft every other day of the week, then that level of absolute nitty gritty can be uh, daunting. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know about all of our viewers, but I personally have in front of me probably somewhere between 12 to 20 aircraft checklists sitting on my desk, partially because my desk is that of a slob and partially because <laughs> I'm through so many planes. And so, uh, you know, an aircraft you fly all the time, you might have the checklist memorized and a lot of the things are pretty standard on most aircraft, but you know, be careful what you wish for. For example, the SSG 747-800 are really working towards a very high level of complexity. And uh, if you understand Boeing logic, it's not bad. But uh, I've got an example in the video of I ran into something that almost looked like a systems failure, but actually turned out to be incredibly hyper-realistic simulation of uh, hydraulic loss. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know... If you're just jumping planes for fun, that could be annoying. If you're flying it all the time and you want hyper realism, that's cool. So, uh, there, there's something you guys can leave in the comments. What, you know, how how real do you like your aircraft? Or maybe leave us an, an example. Like, I really like IJ737. That's my my favorite. I don't want it any more complicated than that. Or I like the flight factor. I'm a Zebo person, and I, I download the newest one before it's even stable, and then complain about it. You know, t- tell us where are you at in this. What's your level of complexity that you enjoy? Yeah, right. And we made that comment in the uh, FS Elite video about this Carinado formula. They're one of the devs that are across multiple platforms, right? And that's unique. So maybe that's why they've sort of standardized this approach. It always has the autopilot menu. It always has these. These, uh, I would call it a pop out, except they don't really pop out. They're always there. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, some people don't like the Carinados, but it's, it's a known quantity, you know, is a Carinado McDonald's, you know what you get every time. Right. And for you and I, sometimes it's refreshing to fly something like a Carinado because there isn't this huge learning curve. Um, so yeah, let us know. What, what do you guys like? What, what's the system's depth? What's a, what's an airplane or a product that you enjoy flying and why? Leave that below. Lee, you just gave me nightmares of remembering some of these projects we jumped into where we download it. And then we have like 60 pages of manuals to read. Yeah, that just happens. Just to be able to perform a cold and dark. Yep, that's happened. Which is, I mean, it's no big deal. Don't, don't get me wrong. I absolutely love that i geeked out the problem is we, we had a time frame and that's what made it tricky <laughs> it's like so what, uh when am i gonna do this and do f- a cross country and do a familiarization flight and record it and <laughs> and yeah, and i got 60 pages before i can even turn it on <laughs> i think there was one video wasn't there tim where i actually read the manual because i was able to do that that fit my schedule but you were doing the flying so then we just kind of threw it together yeah, I remember a little bit of like, hey, it does this weird thing. You're like, well, yeah, and telling me the why. And I was like, oh. Right, right. I had only read. Well, uh, I see we're at just about spot on one hour, especially once we tag on the intro here. Mm-hmm. So uh, what what do you think, Lee? Are we... Uh, are we- Let's get one last tidbit in here. Let's let's go ahead and hit what we've got here real quick, um, if we can keep it short. Um, guys, today, again, the 19th that we're recording this, uh, I put an article up on Facebook, and it is five aircraft every pilot should fly. Go take a look at our Facebook. Take a look at the link below. Read it. And FT 2019, by the way. What's that? Light FT 2019. Yes, Facebook. yeah. Right, right. And um, let us know, one, we're not going to ruin it and tell you what they are, but how many of those aircraft have you flown, either real or virtual, and if you had a list of five aircraft, maybe in sim, leave those below as well. We want to see what you guys think. Hey, uh, Lee, tell me your numbers. I've, got, I've flown two of those. I've flown two of those in sim. I've flown one of those in real life, and one of those actually in my uh 
owned in, in the family. Um, I have flown one of those in real life. I have flown four of them in sim, and I have not had a real world one in the family. I know. I feel special. <laughs> did, did, did that answer all of them? All the questions? Nice. Well, so uh, if nobody puts in the comments, we're not following up on that. But if, if somebody chimes in on the comments, then we'll uh, we'll get in the comments. We'll let you know what we've uh, what we've flown there. We'll tell you more about it later. So uh, make it a conversation. Yeah, Thanks. for sure. All right. And down to just some bullet pointy type things. So, uh, Lee, I'm going to let you kind of continue here. Sure, sure. Um, we'll, we'll touch real quick on... Just Flight Air Hauler, you guys know we picked that up. Tim and I are both playing that. I have discovered that sometimes an Air Force base with larger runways is cheaper than a municipal. So if you're playing that game, uh, shop around for your bases. Um, I'm starting some commodity and factory building, so I'm learning how that's going to go. Hopefully that will. I can talk more about that in a podcast or uh, a future video. If you've got any tips on the commodities and factories... Again, please leave that below as well. I'm learning, and uh, Tim has not crossed that bridge yet. But right, I do have one tip for everybody though. Uh, uh, Lee, Lee's doing larger aircraft. He's got full sized airliners. I'm doing mostly um, GA and turbos. And my biggest uh, aircraft right now is a Dornier three two eight turbo. But I have discovered a PC twelve Otis hands down most economical jack of all trade doable in, in that size category and uh i bought i got rid of like three of my aircraft i now have six five or six uh lotus in my fleet nice and and i think in about a it's been like a week since i bought those all mm -hmm. they're already all paid off nice something i can't say for my uh 727, 757, and 737. <laughs> yeah, no, those things have like earned their keep. They are rounding out the jobs. Insanely capable aircraft. So, stuff. Well, that's definitely a good tip. All right. Do um, you want to talk about your Seneca? Yeah, yeah. So, we mentioned that Carinado sale up there. They were doing about 40% off, and Tim's well aware of it. I picked up the. Uh, PA-34 Seneca, which for those unfamiliar with, is a um, a twin, uh, a la Beechcraft Baron. And I got it really for two factors. One, it's turbocharged, so I don't have a turbocharged general aviation airplane, so I wanted to learn how to manage the turbos and just have that experience. And it also had the G500 Garmin. And I know a lot of us, including the default aircraft, have the G1000 maybe some experience with those. I did not have any G500, so really just the turbochargers and the the new avionics package I wanted to experience with that Seneca, so that's kind of what led me there. How about you, Tim? What'd you pick up? All right, so I have just been spend crazy. I grabbed the Carinado Fokker 50. I've wanted it for a long time, and since they were running a sale, I had to have it. Um. Also, while we've been recording this podcast during Lee's part, I finally just gave in and went and bought the the Lodestar. Um, and an interesting little note, Lee, I didn't know this. This just came up when I was checking out uh, xplane.org store. Said, you know, would you like to donate one dollar? It's funny. It's like I feel like I'm in a real store now. <laughs> would you like to donate one dollar to the Pan Am Museum? And I, I clicked yes on it. Can I and, donate uh, too? <laughs> what's funny is I had actually donated money through um, GoFundMe. And then Museum, because they're, uh, they're shut down. And how would I put it? The reason I bought this aircraft, we, we, we could have probably gotten it for free to do a review. Sure. I just really felt like I want to support this guy. I want him to make more aircraft or her. Or if it's multiple people, whoever, because, you know, these are the things that are really underrepresented in our fleets is this old stuff. So sure. I, I want them to have my $24. 
thing with the Pan Am Museum. When COVID's over, I want the Pan Am Museum to exist. Am I ever going to be in town to go visit it? I don't know. But I want it to be there. Sure. So um, it, it was worth worth throwing a dollar at and right them on uh, GoFundMe. Well, in, you know, Tim, speaking of that, even though a lot of museums are shut down now, look for your favorite museum. Go to their website, buy some swag, get you a coffee mug or something, uh, support them that way. Right. Oh, can I thought toss a thing in here? Yeah, fire uh, there's, it's is it Cockpit 360? I was telling you about the yeah. other day. We were talking. Uh, it's a free app. You can do it on Android or iPhone. Cockpit 360. You have a relationship with a number of museums. Now, don't get too excited when you get the app. It's going to look like it's a million museums. And most of them, when you click, it's going to say like, you know, work in progress. But. Uh, one that they've already gotten a lot of their exhibits done for the U.S. Air Force Museum at uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Dayton, Ohio. And so uh, they've got these 360 views where you click the image with your phone. You can scroll around and look. Very, very high-def imagery. And so I was checking out the uh, cockpit of the, uh, was that Sam 2500? I think so. I don't know the tail on it. Uh, it was uh, the Kennedy era 707 that was Air Force One. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's immaculately named. And I have, you haven't already figured out I'm a real geek. And 707 is probably at the top of my wish list. It's Well, you do I, have a book that's, I think you actually got through the whole thing, didn't you? Oh, yeah. The Haynes Chilton's cover. Manual or whatever. I don't remember if it's Haynes or Chilton's uh, Guide to the 707. I, I strongly recommend that book to anybody. Author's great. Just the fact that he finishes it says something. Yeah, Lee rags me because he reads, he reads a book at a time, and I, I have, uh, I think I counted over 50 books in my house in progress. Nice. Uh, yes. All right. So <laughs> we're off the rails there. We got one more news brief for us, Lee. What's uh, what do we got here? Did, did you talk about the Fokker, and then I'll hit that last one? Yeah, I just mentioned I bought it. Oh, I, okay. I've only bought it once, and it was just a quick little boop boop, just to make sure it ran. All right. Well, in a turn of something a little different, guys, we decided to bring in a little real world news. Uh, unfortunately, on July third, we um, we lost Emily Howell Warner. She was the first woman captain for a scheduled U.S. airline. And uh, she became the first woman to fly jets on a permanent basis for a U.S. airline. She has numerous achievements. Um, Her uniform is displayed in the National Air and Space Museum. She's in the National Aviation Hall of Fame, a Women's uh, Women in Aviation Pioneer Hall of Fame, National Women's Hall of Fame. Just was a real trailblazer for women in aviation. And she was enshrined in the National Aviation Hall of Fame in 2014. Again, she passed in July 3rd of this year. Click on the link below for more information. That's over on flyingmag.com. And uh, just wanted to bring that in, guys, because that is such a significant, um, very significant person in aviation. And we just wanted to share that with you guys. Fantastic. I'm glad Lee brought that up. I had not seen that article. And uh, it's really interesting to see these stories, uh, male or female, just all the you know, aviation is really only slightly over 100 years of aviation, right? Right, right. And so in many ways, these are these are the, all the trailblazers. These are the people who are going to be in the history books. Time, like when you go back and you find your great explorers who were on ships discovering the world when no one knew what was there. Yeah, totally. I mean, even in the uh, in there, they mention you know Helen Ritchie. Uh, she was the first woman to be hired as a pilot. Uh, Bessie Coleman, the first African American and Native American to hold an international pilot's license. Willa Brown, first African American woman to earn a pilot's license in the United States. So I mean, these are you know, be where you want on social issues, Tim. Uh, we have these discussions, and this isn't the platform for that, but. These are significant people, significant milestones in aviation. And guys, we're, we're simming something that is real and, uh, you know, quite, uh, quite a trailblazer. And what an important person uh, to have lost on uh, July 3rd of this year. 
All right, so uh, Captain Warner, salute you, and we're just about the end of the podcast here. So uh, I always say we might be out of time, certainly not run out of things to talk about. <laughs> so uh, thank you for joining us on Podcast 4, and we'll see you in about a month for Podcast number 5. So until then, I'm Tim. And I'm Lee. Remember, plan the flight. And fly the plan.